Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. I took three kids to Target on a few weeks before Christmas. Like, I thought I was a wiser woman than that. Don't you know, Michaela, they have order pickup. You pull in, you open your trunk, you say thank you to the gentleman or gentlewoman, and then you leave. And you don't deal with stressful people and you get to stay in your bubble. No, I chose to go outside my bubble. I chose to go into Target with three children of the ages of 10, eight, and four. Four, four, okay. So literally, I don't know if the teachers were mad at the parents or what, but they said for all of the children to bring a gift to school, to give to Toys toys for Tots, unwrapped to give, and they had to bring it and give it away. So what I did, I thought it was a great idea. This is to be such a special moment to teach my kids how to be generous. So I walk over to the toy aisle, and instantly I lose all three of them. And I'm like... Micah, are you down this aisle? Maverick, are you over here? Mir, 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 are you here? And they're all picking out toys that they wanted. Mommy, we want this, we want this. I'm like, no, this is for somebody else. You have to pick a toy for somebody else. And then fits and fights and argument. And I left so stressed and so tired. And everyone's telling you to be of good cheer. I don't know, unless you're in the awakened bubble where we do tell you to be of good cheer and you have friends of like mind here. If you go out there, They're flipping you off or running you off the road. People are mean. They're not telling you to be of good cheer. So I'm just sitting there wondering, is it the most wonderful time of the year? And it's busy and it's full and it can be stressful and it can be exhausting. But God's designed us to live a wonderful life, but also live a wonderful life. Where sometimes we're in moments where we wonder What in the heck is going on, God? What in the heck are you trying to say? What in the heck are you trying to teach me in this moment? A wonderful life. God designed us to live a life devoted to him no matter what happens to us. So the title of this message this morning is A Wonderful Life. Oh, it's so pretty. I love it. I love it. I wanted to, um, you know, before I got this, the actual word I was going to preach, the Lord told me to preach on Job. Okay, a wonderful life, preach on Job. Okay, God, I'm wondering, what do you mean? Yes, I know it sounds a little intense, but you'd be shocked by the amount of revelation that can come from this man's story. And so we're going to dive straight into it and learn about the life of Job. How many here, just out of curiosity, have come for the first time since our night of Christmas last night? Anybody? We had some in the first service. Where? There you. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming to visit us. Okay, see, that's the reason why we do what we do. And Mark's story, too. Mark, you did such an incredible job on your offering message. I'm like standing there going, this is why we do what we do. Like, drop the mic. No one needs to preach. It's amazing. Okay. Let's uh, dive into Job. In the land of ooze, you, there lived <laughs> ooze. Maybe it's just ooze. There lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, 10 kids. Oh my goodness, my husband's dream. And he owns, he married the wrong person though. So cancel. He married the very right person. He just has a different idea of how many kids we want. And he owns 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of fasting had run its course, feasting, I'm sorry, had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. On the day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? 
Could you guys imagine being in the middle of a conversation where the Lord and Satan are talking to each other? I mean, that would be so fascinating. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? My servant Job? <laughs> Job? <it? laughs> New name. Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, have you not put a hedge of protection a hedge around him and his household and everything he has. You have blessed the work of his hand so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has, remember that, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Everything he has, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And so today I'm going to go through three questions as my three points, because those are the way that God posed the questions to me as I was working through this and writing it. Three questions. And they bring in all three components, the component of you and your relationship with yourself, your relationship with God, and your relationship with the community around you. So the first question is this, what has you? We see in Job 1.12, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has in your power, but on the man, do not lay a finger. So here's Job who has everything. He has wealth, he has property, he has a family that he loves dearly. Clearly he loves and likes his wife because they have 10 children who are now adults. And then God permits Satan to attack. And it's not the preaching that we want to hear, but why does this happen? Why does this happen? And I really believe because the Lord knew where Job's heart was. The Lord knew that, yeah, yeah, devil, go ahead. Go ahead and take everything he has because he'll, I'll still have his heart. I believe that in the midst of when things are important and we live in a society of materialism and Christmas season can make it even harder, you know, you go shopping for somebody and you see that thing and you're like, well, I could use one of those too, you know, like, why don't I just buy two, one for myself and one for the other person? And I'm telling you, in the midst of this season especially, what has you? What has you? If God permitted Satan to take every single thing away from you, how would you respond? And we're going to dive into this and see how Job responds. Because Job never lets his heart become sour. He never lets his heart turn from God. But all of the things that are important to him the most are taken, including his family, including his things, including his family, including his wealth. And it was so funny this week. I mean, when you're writing a message and everything's just glaring you in the face and the Holy Spirit is like blaring something for you to work on, I'm like unpacking my nativity scene. Okay, nativity scene. My grandma used to bring us grandkids along. There's 12 of us and she would invite us all over. And it was like this moment we got together and we set up our nativity scene with my grandma. It was so important to her. And I'm set, I go to set up my nativity scene. I open the box and the first porcelain man comes out, a king with no head. <laughs> it's sad, but it's also a lull. <laughs> it's like, how could you kind of not laugh at that? Go to the next picture. <laughs> a king with no hands. <laughs> a king with no hands and a king with no head. And I was so angry. I was not lolling in the moment. I was literally like, it was supposed to be this special moment. I'm going to reminisce about my memories with my grandma. I'm going to set up my nativity scene. It's so beautiful. That stubborn tree in the other room I can't handle anymore because it has a mind of its own. So I'm going to focus on this nativity scene. I open the box and the first two guys come out. And I start, I think my husband's sitting in the kitchen. I'm like, everything is broken. All our Christmas decorations are ruined. Who packed it up? Who brought it here from storage? Who did all this? Somebody broke it. I'm so mad. And he's like, you have issues. <laughs> <laughs> I think he actually might have been silent in that moment, which means my husband is saying, you have issues. Because <laughs> he's like the guy that won't say something because he has such great power over his words. Like, it's really something he's good at. And he's just like <laughs> sitting there with his eyes. And all I could hear was, you have issues. You have issues. You have issues. <laughs> and it was so funny and so 
hilarious in the moment of going, wow, God, like I, this is about you and I'm angry and mad and all these mean things are coming out of me. But how many of you know, something that's in you is in you, no matter whether or not you try to keep it out of you, when you get triggered, it's in you. So if you're like, oh, that anger is because of you. No, it's not. It's in you. So I'm like, oh, there's some anger in there I got to deal with. And then the nativity scene weeded it out of me. So we fixed it. We fixed the, the guys. We got the special porcelain glue and beautiful Esther put it back together. She come, comes and fixes it. And then there's the tree, the stubborn tree I mentioned. It's like the first day we got it up, it took a few hours. It's like it had its mind of its own. We got all the things. It was like 17 feet high. My husband got it on like some website. <sighs> So, I'm, so we had one little section on the bottom that we couldn't quite get. And so I'd been working on it. And it was like the last piece that was like this perfect tree. And I'm sitting there and Esther had already been working on it for hours on end. God bless her. I mean, just thank you, Esther, for, for making my house look pretty and saving my emotions. But um, so we get... I finally get that section working and Esther starts decorating the whole thing and then she leaves and then I'm sitting there that night and I'm just staring at the tree and it's beauty and the whole thing turns off. <laughs> it's a pre-lit tree. And I'm like, Matt, where did you even get this tree? It's a piece of junk. It doesn't even work. Like, can't you buy something that works? Wouldn't you just buy something new that actually works? Why do you have to buy it used? Like, why do we have to try to save money? Can't you just get one that actually works? Why do I have to be stressed all week? Don't you know I'm preaching this week? I'm literally throwing myself so far under the bus. This is hashtag real life in the Hubbard household. So we had some moments this week, and it was ironic because I'm reading about Job and going, wow, you are so stubborn and silly and spoiled. You need to stop it. And I'm like, yes, I do need to stop it. Lord, help me. But we can see that Job's life seems to be wonderful. It seems to be perfect. It seems to be planned out. He seems to have it all together. He has a great relationship with God. God calls him one of the greatest men in all the land. Could you imagine who here wants to be the greatest man and woman in all the land? Yes, I do. Clearly, I'm very far from it. But he was greatest amongst the people. And I'm telling you, this reveals why God chooses and, and permits and says, yes, okay, Satan, go ahead and mess with my man, Job, because I know I've got him. I know he's got me. I know I got him. And it reveals why he's the greatest, because when he comes to the suffering and the pain and whatever Satan had to bring him, Job stands strong. Job stands strong. And he will learn in the next point what happens with Job. But, you know, you can't work your way into a perfect life. Oftentimes, even in the church world, we can hinge our accomplishments in ministry. We can hinge our accomplishments as a Christian, getting people saved. And it becomes like this performance thing. And like Job, he, he seemed to have the perfect life, but he still faced problems. We can line up everything so perfect. I had this week planned so perfect. That house was going to be decorated by Monday. I was going to work on my message Tuesday. I was going to preach it out loud Wednesday. And then Thursday, I was going to feel great. I was going to go to night of Christmas, and I was going to come here feeling like Joyce Meyer. <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> but none of that happened. So even among the greatest people in all the land, ish happens. Things happen. And, and what we have to do is, is look at the way we respond because what's in there was already in there. And the things and the circumstances that happen around us is less about what's around us, but what's in us and what comes out of us. I've been serving and, you know, I'm facing this problem, but I've been serving my whole life. I've been serving Jesus. I've been tithing. I've been tithing. I've been trying to get a job. I've been tithing. These things aren't happening. I know because you can do all the right things and sometimes all the right outcomes don't happen. Sometimes we can do every single little thing perfect. Job had it perfect, almost perfect, even was close with God and still didn't have the perfect outcome. These are the moments we respond as Job did, and we lead into question number two. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? And the interesting thing about this question is there's actually a yes or no question. There's no like, I don't know, maybe in this situation if... And maybe if, they, if I see this sign, I'll trust God. There's not like a scale from one to 10, like 
you know, sometimes my husband and I use scale from one to 10. How did I do on this and this and our marriage agenda? We sit down. Did I do a seven? Did I do a six? Did I do a five? How are my parenting skills? No. Do you trust God? Yes or no? Do you trust God? Yes or no? Because if Job trusted God on a scale from one to 10, seven, I don't think it would have worked out the way it worked out. He had to trust God, period. When his pain and his suffering, everything he has is taken away from him. He even, so bad, because when, when Satan comes and takes everything away, Job is left, and he's still standing strong for the Lord. Satan comes back to God and said, he's still strong. Can I do more? And the Lord permits him to do more, but don't let him die. So then Satan comes back and makes Job get sick. And then Job is sick to the point of almost death, and he still strand, stands strong for the Lord. Job chose to trust. In Job 19, this is how one of the instances, and there's many throughout the book of Job on how he responded, but one that stood out to me, 1925. I know, I know. It's not I think, it's not maybe, I'm thinking about it. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Is that our response when life happens? Is that our response when someone cuts us off? Is that our response when we don't get the job? Is that our response when our kids do something they shouldn't do? Is that our response when our spouse does something annoying? And these are all like, these are all first world problems, in my opinion. Job was to the point of death, but he had to 10 out of 10 trust God. And then have you ever questioned God? It's okay to question God. This is what Job says. He questioned God over 25 times, asking why, and continually asked God for the opportunity to defend himself. And he said this, Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. You want to defend yourself all day long to God about why you shouldn't be in trouble and why this shouldn't be happening? God is okay with that as long as your trust remains in him. As long as at the end of questioning God, you come to the culmination of I trust God and I know that he's in this and I know he's doing something and I know I'm going to come out the other side of this because Job's response isn't that he's just literally going to come out the other side of it. He then go, goes on next level. You got like trust scale one to 10 and then you got Job trust. Job trust says this in 2310, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. In the midst of our suffering and pain and confusion and questioning, do we know that we're gonna come out better, even better than before we started? So I'm not just trying to come out of this thing the same or a little bit better. No, refined gold. I'm coming out of this thing like gold. I'm coming out of this thing on top. I'm coming out of this valley on the top of the mountain. These things may happen, but because I trust God, I know he's going to make me better, not bitter about the situation. And I'm going to be like gold. <sighs> Should I talk about his wife? Then there's the wife. Listen up, wives. I'm one who, I'm listening to myself. Even at the depths of Job's suffering, he engages God, and he rejects the call from his wife to curse God and die. Job 2, 9 says this. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Are you still trusting God? Can we just get this over with? Come on, move it along, bro. Curse God and die. Get, let's get this done with. God, she, she tries to convince Job to give up, to, to curse God. And this is how he replies. You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? We only trust God when things are good? Come on, babe. No. We don't only trust God. That is, that is the man that you want to marry single women is a man that will stand on God when he's good and when he doesn't seem so good. <clears throat> I can remember one of the biggest moment of trust tests in my life personally. And my husband and I went through this together, but I believe God did something in me personally that I would never trade in. And that was, was when we went through an infertility. And the first few years of marriage, we, I decided 
I said, we're not going to get pregnant for five years. And a little did I know that was placing a prophecy over our life. And after a couple years, we wanted to get pregnant. I jumped on board. My husband wanted to get pregnant right away, of course, because he wanted to get started on these 10 children that were coming from I don't know where. We did not discuss this in pre-marriage counseling and sign on the dotted line. No, we didn't. <clears throat> but um, after a couple years, we started trying to get pregnant. We were on the same page. And then sure enough, it wasn't until year five that we actually got breakthrough in this area. But we had found this doctor in LA and I had to go up there every single day for a, a couple weeks. And I had to go there a few times in a row and I had to drive there by myself. And in this, this time was really hard for me. And I think it was really hard for me because this was the first time I really had to lean on my own faith with God. I really had to have my own understanding of trusting God. Because to be honest, every other part of my life, like I was raised in a good family. I wasn't necessarily raised Christian, but I was raised with, raised with good values. And the only time I did anything bad was because I had some other friends that told me to do it. So I did it like I was a really good follower. And... <clears throat> then I met Matt, like, on an airplane. I came to church, got saved. Like, everything seemed really good. And I, I never thought I would have to walk through something on my own and, and build up my own faith muscle. And I remember driving to L.A., a couple of times just in complete tears. Like I was by myself, a few, friend, a few times some friends came with me, a few times my husband was able to go, but there was a few times where I, I just had to go by myself because I had to go. And it was a 6 a.m. driving, three-hour drive, traffic. I hate traffic. Like all my faith is tested in traffic. I'm just putting it out there. And so just this one day, I literally lost it. Like, like blubbering mess, hyperventilating, like literally going why God, I have done nothing wrong. Like, I literally have lived such a great life. Like, I know I wasn't necessarily a Christian, but I still was a good girl. Like, I didn't, I'm not like stealing things from people, I'm not like killing anybody, <laughs> not like I, I used, barely even cuss. Like, I literally, like, I was a really good person. And having this conversation with God, and, and it was in that process and in that season where a faith came out of me that I never knew was in me. And now people, I see moms all the time that are like really fearful of their kids and like worried about what they're doing and like helicopter moms is what I call them. And I actually honestly have never had to struggle with that because of the faith that I had to develop in that time and season of having kids. We have three kids now and they're all complete miracles. Um, but I don't, I'm not a helicopter mom. And someone asked me one time, like, why are, how, why, how are you so chill, like, with your kids? And I'm like, because I trust God. I had to trust God that I could have these children. And now I have the faith that nothing crazy is going to happen to them. And, and if it is, it's not because, like, my stressing and worrying about them is not going to make it better. Like, I'm just going to stand in faith and pray and prophesy that my kids will be follow, followers of Christ and be protected all the days of their lives. But I'm not going to sit around afraid of what might happen to them. And I really think it was in that season where God stretched my faith to be able to be who I am now as a mom. And so 1 Peter 5, 7, to close this point, is this. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. All right, ready for question number three? Okay, this one's good. This is my favorite part of the message. And I left a whole 11 minutes for it. Alex is excited. Point number three, question number three, who's in your life? Who's in your life? So if you've read the story of Job, it gets a little redundant, but basically over half the book is about his friends. And I'm like, interesting. Let me examine these friends. We'll come to find out these friends aren't so awesome. These three friends come in the midst of Job, basically on his deathbed, having lost everything, being confused, wondering what what God's doing. He knows God, but he's still confused and he's questioning and he's suffering. And his friends come with the right intention. And these friends, if you read about them, they actually came from the same sort of social status. They came from the same sort of religious status. So they were very similar type of people. And his three friends come and they consult. At first they're like, all right, let's let Job kind of like let out his stuff. So Job like airs what's going on. And then as soon as they get the chance to speak, 
all three of them, they came into agreement and all three of them started condemning Job, started asking Job, well, what'd you do wrong? Started asking Job, what sin was there that you committed? Job, why don't you just take a think about it? What did you actually do to cause this? So they came in with a judgmental spirit. They came in the midst when a man needed friends, when a man needed love, when a man needed comforting. Men need those things too, you know? It's not only the ladies that need a hug sometimes. Sometimes our men need a hug and a console and a comfort. And these three men came in and they brought complete judgment. And they just started asking, look, look, what have you done, Job? And Job replied with this. It's interesting. It locates where his friends were. Job 19, two to three. How long will you torment me and crush me with your words? Ten times now you have reproached me. Shamelessly you attack me. In Job 16, two, he says this. I have heard many things like these. You are miserable comforters, all of you. Are you a miserable comforter? Am I a miserable comforter? These are questions that we, and do we have miserable comforters in our life? Are you, are you afraid? Is there a friend in your life you're afraid to tell something because you're afraid how they're going to respond? Is there a family member in your world where you're afraid to tell because you're afraid of how they're going to respond? Let's not be miserable comforters. In life, sometimes we walk through mysteries and nobody knows why what's happening. I didn't know why I was going through this infertility thing, but I can tell you I did not have girlfriends that sat me down and told me it's because I had sex before marriage. No, I didn't have that. We need to have friends that come and bring comfort. We need to have friends that come and bring love and grace. How do we show up as friends? And I want to caveat this a little bit because this is different from discipleship because I definitely don't want anyone going down the road of, well, that person was trying to disciple me and it was mean. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about friends in your close inner circle of people that love you and that you know love, love you and you love them. Are we miserable comforters or are we amazing comforters? What kind of friend are you? What kind of friends do you have? It reminded me of a story in the Bible where the man, there was a man that was born blind. And Jesus came and healed him. But before that, the Pharisees were asking, well, to the parents, why was he born blind? Parents, were you sinners? Um, man that was born blind, were you a sinner? There was no in there of like, well, what if it just happened? Why does it have to be because there was a sin? John 9, 16, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But the others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. This judgmental spirit, critical spirit brings in division. And we see it in the church world and it's literally driving me nuts. And this is where I really wanna hit home with this is because we have to be so, so careful in the church world because we are Christians, we're striving for the best. We're striving to do the right thing. We're striving to be the right thing. We're striving for a closer relationship with God. But that doesn't mean any of us are perfect. Surprise, we're all human. Surprise. And God is not shocked by your humanity. So why is the people in your world shocked by it? Why are you shocked by the people in your world and the things that they do? Matthew 7 says this, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Especially social media. You have the, it's fake fighting. It's fake confrontation. It's fake judgment. So you have this little phone. You're sitting in the comfort of your home, chillaxing, and you're judging people through a little screen and it's going out to the entire world. Like, how, how bad is that? That's not the way God designed communication, confrontation, discipleship. All of those are to be one-on-one, face-to-face, in community, in relationship. And I'm getting really mad at all those meanies on social media, if I'm honest. (laughs) Because it's so easy to judge in that place. It's so easy to get so angry with someone and go type up a real quick post. And, And then that person reads it later and goes, oh, I think they were talking about me. Yeah, it's obvious. So let's not take out our judgments through social media. I mean, at least let's not do it on social media. Like for real, let's not even do it in real life. But... 
that kind of judgment and that type of confrontation is totally fake and not of God. And even like the, this opportunity is going to hit so close to home to bring judgment to the people you're closest with. So to the people you were raised around, your brothers and sisters, your parents, and then your spouse, and even your kids when they get old enough. And I want to speak into just in marriage, like, oh my gosh, has there been so many times where I'm like, oh, babe, you know why you're so tired? It's because you didn't flip and go to bed till midnight every night last week. Oh, babe, you know why you don't feel good? It's because you didn't get adjusted like four times last week why you said you were going to. Oh, babe, you know why you're so, you know, like you feel like crap right now? It's because you got in that cold plunge for two minutes yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> in he's right there but in marriage it can be so easy and this like the holy spirit was like ouch to me this week because i'm like this towel on the floor this flipping mess in the kitchen this tree that he bought the outside's not even decorated and he said he was going to decorate it so much judgment could be brought but let's stay away from the judgment. Let's bring love and mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. If we have the opportunity, especially during Christmas, to extend mercy where there's a lack of understanding what God is doing, let's do that and speak truth with love. Amen? Amen. Is that good? Okay. You guys need a spoonful of sugar now since I gave you some medicine? Okay. We're going to come to a close now. If I can have the spirit fingers come up. <laughs> These are all things I'm very lacked in talent in, like all the musician stuff and creative and all that. So I'm very appreciative of these people that are amazing. So in closing, can we all stand to our feet? See, Job lived a wonderful life, what seemingly was wonderful, that brought him to a wonderful life. Asking questions, wondering, confused. And this might be seasons of some of your lives. This might be what might feel like your entire life for some people. This might be just yesterday for some people. And I wanted to take this moment to show you how Job responds, because in the end of the story, if you don't know it, Job is restored everything, even much better than it, he started. And God restores everything. He gets everything back. His relationship with God is intact. And that, that's how God works. All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. But in this moment, I wanted to encourage anyone here that is in a, a season of wondering where is God? Where's the voice of God? What is God doing? Why am I facing this? Why am I going through this? I just want you to lift your hand because I'm going to pray over those certain people. In the last service, we had over half of the auditorium lift their hands. And trust me, I've had moments in my life, almost on a weekly basis. What are you doing, God? What are you doing? Where are you in this? Did I hear you wrong? Why am I confused? And I want to Keep your hands lifted. This is how Job replied to the Lord. When God comes to speak to Job, finally, thank God, this is Job's response. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. There are things that we are facing and questions that we have that are too wonderful for us to know. There are things that God is doing that's too wonderful for us to know. In that, those car rides I took going back and forth from San Diego to LA in with the eager desire to be pregnant with our first baby, there was moments where I asked God, if I had known what he was gonna do in giving me the three children he's given me now, I wouldn't have been crying but that was too wonderful for me to know. It was too wonderful me, for me to know the life that God had for me. You're in the middle of something and on the other side of it is the golden version of yourself. On the other side of it is the thing that's too wonderful for you to know. So every hand that orig originally lifted, lift your hand right now, I'm gonna pray over you. God, I thank you, I prophesy 
wonderful things. I prophesy incredible things. I prophesy breakthrough. I prophesy supernatural babies in this place. I prophesy supernatural finances in this place. I thank you for breakthrough. I thank you where there's confusion, there is peace that surpasses all understanding. When you don't know which way to go, turn right, turn left, God, where do I go? I pray right now that there is no anxiety, that there is peace, God, that our hand, our lives are in the palm of your hands, God. I thank you, Lord, on the other side of this valley is a mountaintop. On the other side of this moment is an incredible promise, Lord, that there is something too wonderful for us to know. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. I thank you, Lord, for your precious people and that during this season, they would encounter your love like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.